Clay with the, I think, invention of the word hollow novel in this episode called Heroes mm. and Demons. Got me thinking, if you had a hollow deck or hollow suite, if you were fancy and rich, <laughs> depending what the difference is there, if you had one of those two magical devices that are no different than transported technology, as they say here, what would have... Um, what would be the novel of choice that you would use? Is there any story that you would want to insert yourself into? Um, um, no pun intended there. Would you Would you go with Beowulf as this episode did? Would you do something more written by someone that we know, like Shakespeare? Would you do something really stupid, like uh, Archie and the Riverside Gang? Where would you Where would you find yourself if i were to bust into your hollow suite and say computer stop program what would i walk myself into um probably in cold blood because i've always wanted to know what it's like to kill a family <laughs> i always think unless about unless it. unless you can get to choose who you can be and then i would want to be the person who catches the guys who do that obviously Yep. You wouldn't you wouldn't want to be just Capote like going there and writing about what it's like to catch the guy. <laughs> yeah. No. That's that's the thing. Like what are the parameters of this? Can you could you get to choose your character? Are there like could you insert yourself into like Dracula as Dracula and just kill a whole bunch of people? I think you could. Yeah. All I, right. I, I would go with that. Yeah. So there's no there's, you know, barring however embarrassed you would feel to admit it to however many people listen to the show, you can go with anything. But I, all I could think of, I was, I was kind of thinking like, oh, I do. When I started thinking about it, I, my first ideas and my initial thoughts were too, um, s like scary. I like I'm I'm actually thinking about this as like the holodeck seems like it's a real thing, right? And I, right, a lot of the right. stuff that I was coming up initially was like potentially really violent stuff that I was like, ooh, I don't know if I want to get shot on the holodeck or something like that. So I don't right. know anything about that. I ended up with... Um, well, at least you hedged your bets and didn't say it out loud like I did. Right, exactly. I, I, I let you go first like a true gentleman. <laughs> um, I, I came up with, I really like escape the room type stuff. And mm. I would like to do like a clue game or something like where i'm in a locked house yeah. or room and i have sure. to solve a mystery and there's no real threat of violence like someone's already dead but i'm not going to be killed because mm -hmm. everyone's in the daylight or whatever but i think that would be the most fun i would have if i was trying to do like a a, a beat the room but in a real world situation so you want to be like gosford park or something something where you could yes because the the thing with that the tough thing is like well is that a, just a one use program because i mean Unless they change up the scenario every time, you kind of like if you insert yourself if your if your hollow book of choice is uh, the purloined letter or something by Edgar Allan Poe, mm -hmm. Agatha, you Agatha know, right, Christie or something, yeah, yeah. Second time in, you know the letters right on the bulletin board. You're gonna go right for it. Yeah, I'm I'm imagining there's a little bit of AI development at this point, and it can generate a mystery for me in that universe. So yeah. kind of like Sherlock Holmes, except. More modern than that, I wouldn't want to dress mm. up like Sherlock Holmes. I'd rather have a modern version of it. Do you do you remember that episode of uh, the Prisoner A, B, and C when they uh, yep. they've got six knocked out and they they have three different scenarios trying to figure out who the mole is that he that was yeah he's at a whatever. party or something yes right he's at like that, a, yeah yeah a very dreamy party yes that's the party that's that's the scenario I feel like I'm picturing in my head where it's like you just walk into a cool party and you just have to figure out who's trying to kill you or something like that yeah yep that's what it would be so maybe it would be a version of that for me but I couldn't come up with any uh, novel or anything like any sort of classical literature that I would really want to insert myself into. I was always th thought of it more of a game. I don't think I'd get much out of pretending to be Hamlet or anything like that. I would just, I'd rather right. it be a game. Yeah. I think, you know, I don't know. I feel like I, I, I kind of set it off hand, but I feel like Dracula would be a pretty fun one. Assuming, assuming if you, you could get to be play. Dracula. Well, no, not why. I mean, maybe when you get bored eventually, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Being playing playing Jonathan Harker hunting down Dracula is always kind of fun, or a novelization of one of the Castlevania games if you want to punch it up. Yeah, a little bit. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd that's be a good one too. That's what it would be. It would be like, man, if I could pick any book, mm, probably the second novel in the Halo series. Wes, you know, you can just play <laughs> Halo. You don't have to <laughs> use this super <laughs> futuristic technology to let you play Halo. <laughs> Tetris has never looked so good as it was, I know. It was on the holodeck clay. Yeah. 
That would just be, yeah, it would be me sort of like arranging uh, furniture in a way that my feng shui finds to be very pleasing to me. And we'll go from there. Well, with that said, let's get to the episode du jour. It's called Heroes and Demons. 12th episode of Voyager's first season came out on April 24th, 1995. Written by Naren Shankar, who's an old uh, TNG and DS9 name freelancing for Voyager at this point, directed by Les Landau, in Universe State 48693.2, which is 2371. In this one called Heroes and Demons, when several crew members disappear inside Harry Kim's Beowulf program, the holographic doctor is the only one who can rescue them. Uh, a little bit of behind-the-scenes stuff. This is the first episode where Michael Piller has stepped away from Voyager, at least part-time. He's on his own show called Legend, which I think lasted a single season. It was a sci-fi. It was a sci-fi western. I don't remember that so, at all. No, I think it was on USA or something like that. Um, but he stepped away from Star Trek at this point to uh, at least the degree that he was involved before, which was he was basically show running and writing all the scripts along with everybody. But this is the first of many episodes. He's with the show through the second season, but he's no longer really a showrunner at this point on the show. So here we go with Heroes and Demons. My first thought, before I throw it to you, Clay, this is the first kind of a whiff of a Voyager episode, I thought. And mm. I don't know. I don't know if I just don't care about holodeck episodes anymore, really. Um, they might have to be really exceptional for me to think that it's a good idea to go to the holodeck at this point. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, we've had a lot, like we went through Enterprise, Picard, Discovery. I don't think there's been a hologram, holodeck episode in those series, right? Maybe Discovery, if I'm missing one, none of the others would have had it. Enterprise couldn't do it because of tech reasons. Right. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think there's been a holodeck. Well, <clears throat> technically it shouldn't exist. It, up until the last two seasons, it wouldn't have existed in Discovery. Um, and then... Oh, right. Sure. In Picard, no need to... They haven't had time. Yeah. 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 They can do whatever they want in so, that show. So, so it's, it's, just, it's been a while, I guess. <laughs> and hmm. I don't know how you feel about holodeck episodes at this time. Uh, my... Uh, the way that I sort of came into this one was like once i realized it's a holodeck episode kind of deflated a little bit i was like ah oh no and i i wouldn't say that i actively dislike them but i don't even know if we've talked about this there's something that really stops me from truly buying into and enjoying a holodeck episode and i don't know what it is it's whether or not it's like the artificial construct within mm -hmm. an already artificial construct of the show that i'm like this is two layers too deep and I don't care at this point. I also think that this one just wasn't all that interesting of an episode. and It, it didn't yeah. really hold my attention. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest with you. I actually enjoyed this. Um, hmm. I think it's a, <clears throat> I, I think it could have been, I think they could have done more with it, but I also had the same reaction where once I saw it was a holodeck episode, I was like, okay, all right, well, sure. Let's see what we're doing here. Um, <clears throat> have a little fun romp in the holodeck, I guess. But once they got into the idea of the only person who could go in and fix the situation was the doctor, uh, yeah. that I found really interesting. That, that I was That's a, It's a saving grace. Yeah, it's the saving yeah. grace of the episode is him. I, I still would argue, I guess, that they, they don't really go great guns with that concept outside of the idea that yeah. that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. but that, that alone kept my interest to see what was going on because um, I, I think one of the strengths of this show that Enterprise kind of was missing is Voyager seems to know how to utilize the tools that they have and, and how do they how they utilize the elements that make them unique in the Star Trek franchise. And so doing an episode like this where, you know, how do you make a holodeck episode new? Oh, well, let's use the member of the crew who is entirely holographic and what does that mean for him um, be existing in an, in an environment outside of the one, the only one he's ever seen, which is really a really cool idea. Um, but yeah, I don't think that they uh, pushed it nearly as far as they could have. And outside of the, the general idea, it was fine. Um, it was the, it was, it was less, less bad of a, uh, 
energy creature escapes a tube and flies out into space through the wall of the ship than the one in the first season of Deep Space Nine. Mm-hmm. But um, sure. it was still, it was still, it was, it was fine. It, it kept my interest because I was curious to see. Yeah, <laughs> it, it kept my interest because um, I was curious to see where they were going to go with the Doctor and stuff. And also, let's not bury the lead here. Janeway's got a new haircut. Yeah, she does. Seemed kind of nervous in this one, too. I don't know if that was related to the haircut, but she's, like, biting her fingernails practically in a couple of the scenes here, and I Hmm. thought it was unbecoming of a captain to be so nervous in front of everybody else. (laughs) Um, On positives, I'll say that I also also liked the doctor being the one who can go in and save the day. I thought that that was kind of neat. I don't think that they did a lot. There's more to say about him, I think. I thought that um, Picardo kind of cemented himself as... He's clearly the best actor of this group at this yeah. point because this yeah. episode he does he does drama, which is when he and Kess are kind of talking at the start about he's been chosen to do this and he's a little bit nervous about it. He can he does that well. And he also does the comedy of the episode pretty well. Like when he's eating the the rack of lamb or whatever and talking about mm-hmm. hearing hearing that virus <laughs> and mm-hmm. to people. I thought that was pretty good. Um mostly I I feel that this episode is more impressed with its Beowulf knowledge than it is with anything else about it, which I think is kind of a downside. And I was looking at some of the listings of all the references to Beowulf, and I'm not familiar with that that story whatsoever, besides the fact that I know that there's a character named Beowulf who kills a monster in it. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there's a lot of references to it. And I I found myself just kind of checking out after it becomes clear that the Doctor – in my opinion, does not really react to his situation in a way that the script is trying to set it up that that's the right. case. That he's never been outside yeah. the holiday, the hol- the um, the sick bay before, mm-hmm. and he's like, "This is a whole mm-hmm. new world. I don't know what's going on." He also he never talks to his holographic counterparts as if they're his people in a way that I was kind of disappointed sure. about. Like, sure. you know, that he, I would thought he would see them because the difference between him and them is interesting, right? They're slaves, basically. In his in his mind, right. like they're, right. they are what he is, but they're like enslaved version that can't see the truth of what their reality is in a way that he mm-hmm. does. And he never really gets into that. And the only moment that he actually enjoys the situation is when he first gets there and he's like touching the tree because he's never seen a tree before yeah. and stuff like that. But they drop it immediately after that. And I was kind of disappointed by that, that they it just went Beowulf after that. And I didn't care. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff in there that they that they kind of leave on the table, like the idea that he kind of develops feelings for this woman who is not a real woman. And I mean, he's not a real man. Um, yeah. The, I was kind of hoping they were going to play with the repetition of the program a little bit more. Cause the, every time he drops, every time someone drops in, it like drops in at the same point in the program where they meet Freya and she says the same lines. And then it, like it felt a little bit like Westworld to me. And I was mm-hmm. kind of hoping <clears throat> they were going to go a little bit more in that direction where the doctor would, um, recognize his own existence a bit more uh being able to step outside of his general generalized parameters and stuff like that um <clears throat> but they don't they don't really do that it's just uh <laughs> it's just a man the guy who plays that second in command viking was fucking going for it yeah the he hothead was, the hothead yeah, viking he was great uh, in, in in that <laughs> he was very fun to watch <laughs> Um, yeah, the woman. Yeah, it's not so much. Not not really catching this guy's. Not really competing with this guy's energy was Freya, unfortunately. And she's more important yeah. to the the script, I think. But yeah, I think there's. It's tough because I think <clears throat> I think the thing holding it back from from being able to do that is that I think the Doctor would need to be cut off from the ship. You know what I mean? Like he would need to go in there, and they would need to lose his signal or whatever. But he's yeah. not been absorbed by this thing. He's just now ex- in there, living through the program and experiencing life outside of the ship. Like that's where I think you could have done some really interesting stuff. However, they seem to only have two sets that they could do Viking stuff in, which was <laughs> one was an outside set and one was an inside yeah. set. So they just had to keep bouncing between them uh, and and whatnot. Yeah. Just, uh, do you? Do you find his relationship with Freya to be effective? Because it seems like the episode is leaning heavily on that, and I don't, I don't think it works for me. Um, yeah, like, not really. The fact that he gives up his name at the end is because he's like, oh, it's too, 
it's too hard. That, that's attached to too much bad energy, bad mojo, mojo or whatever, like the uh, mm-hmm. bad juju. Um, I, I, that that felt just like in a, a uh, the show is what it is, and it has to not make any changes at the end of the episode that drastic, so you can't keep his name and stuff like that. It just it didn't. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I never grasped into it in a way that made me feel like the doctor was actually going on a journey that was deserving of the end sequence that they gave him. Yeah. Where Janeway talks to him about it, and it's like it felt it felt very <laughs> light and fluffy for most of it. Yeah. No, I hundred percent agree. I think ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, ultimately, it suffers because it it's kind of too clinical. Um, because it is very much about fixing the problem and the different elements of the problem that they discover. Like, you know, his arm gets cut off, and then then they figure out that it's this thing. It's this you know this, this sphere out in the out in space or whatever. So it's <clears throat> even though they're doing have the potential to do interesting stuff, it's all in service of solving this science plot, basically sci fi plot. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. this is a this is a place where I th- you're probably putting a hat on the hat as far as sci-fi plots go because the holographic doctor who gets to experience life via another holographic program I think is sci-fi enough where you can lean into that quite a bit and get some really good stuff out of it and get like a um, <clears throat> an affecting story like does he have emotions? <clears throat> does he play right. the does he play the whole thing straight and then at the end you only at the end do you realize how much he's been affected by it um i don't know yeah even questioning cuz at this point the show hasn't really explained or gone into why he's unique this way like why is he allowed to have a personality in a way that the other holograms are not allowed to to or to have like their own, his own agency in a way that the other right. holograms right. aren't allowed to do um I've I feel I, like you I, could come up with a reason. Yeah, I'm I'm but, disappointed that they didn't go into that because of the the juxtaposition of him as a character versus other holodeck characters. Um in that <clears throat> holodeck characters are allowed some sort of latitude and ability to think, but ultimately it is all just within the parameters of the program, which you see in this by they hit certain marks, and even if you knock them off course, they eventually come back and hit that next mark. So it's very much like they're going through a program, and they've got a <clears throat> you've got a little bit of uh, video game AI built into it, but ultimately it's still a straight path. Whereas the doctor is built to make dynamic decisions and yep. actually think for himself. So to see those things put in contrast more. I think would have been really interesting and really effective, but unfortunately yeah. not. Yeah. It's, um, it's great untapped potential <laughs> for him. Um, and I think it would flesh out the doctor's character as to why he is this way. Um, the show hasn't really gone into it, but it, it would be interesting to know why they decided for this to be the case. Like I think we've talked about before. Why is he, why is he programmed to be kind of grumpy as a doctor besides like a bonus right. tribute where he's just kind of playing in, in McCoy's shadow or whatever, but why would mm-hmm. he be designed this way? Um, yeah. So it's too bad. It, it's, it's one of those things where, I the the like the bones of the story never really moved into a place where I started to really perk up and go like oh this will be fun once this happens mm-hmm. and once they introduced the idea that it's just an alien that's an energy life form and it's stuck in the ship because we beamed those things on and we have to like it's basically a hostage negotiation at the end they're like if right, we give you right. this you'll give this and then we'll both leave and that'll be the end of it and that was okay I. Um, the the other sort of big aspect of this is that this is a maybe the first episode that is not explicitly shown to be the case of what Voyager's setup is, right? Like the, there's right, no right. there's no Voyager show. stranded. Yeah, this could happen on any show, and well, it came from a freelance pitch. Doctor aside, I mean, I guess you can't do this without that Doctor character, but. Aside from that's that. true, I, yeah, I, I and I, 
Yes, and it's not like the doctor. The doctor is just the able, won't be able uh, is able to be pulled out because they're able to send other people into the holodeck. Like they send Chakotay and Tuvok into the holodeck, but they get mm-hmm. eaten by the thing or whatever. I I think that it's it's the first one that never the first episode of the season that is completely ignoring what Voyager's setup is supposed to be, which yeah. is that there should be some kind of concern about what's going on. And I think that like we've talked about it before. It's kind of bizarre that they've been hemming and hawing and talking about replicator rations and lack of energy, but the holodeck is just running 24 yeah. seven. Yeah. And I don't know, like th- that's a, is that a big mistake or is that just, I don't know how to phrase this. Is, is it a, is that a big mistake that we don't really seem to care mm-hmm. about? Or is that just, Something you have to do on this show. You have to have the holodeck running for to get some episodes out of it. Is is which part the mistake? The mistake that it's a sort of contradictory disservice to everything that they've been setting up as to what Voyager's story is here, which is that they have no supplies, they have no right. really thing going right. on out there, but the holodeck is still functional. Right. They can't or they allowed, can't to, make, allowed to be run. They can't make coffee. But they can run right. the holodeck for hours. On yeah, end. people people can go, the, the show, <clears throat> Chateau de, de Fouca or whatever the Tom Paris has running. You got you got Harry Kim spending hours upon it. I think they say he's been in there for like four days before anyone realizes that he's missing or something like that. So it's, right. I don't yeah. know. He's it's strange you don't see Kim either. He's just not in the episode whatsoever. He's just yeah, he's yeah, gone. It's, yeah. Um, just gets eaten. Yeah, I I I don't know. I I think probably. The show seems in general like it's not sticking too closely to its own premise, unfortunately, uh, and that it will pop up when dramatically necessary, but otherwise they're not living – they're not writing each episode based on whether or not it conflicts with <clears throat> what they've established about their energy resources and stuff. Like like even even in this one, even if you wanted to – if you wanted to run the holodeck, you could, you could do something like, oh, well, if we're going to run the holodeck, we need to limit the programming to single or double room situations or some shit like that mm-hmm. where it's like you don't have the op- opportunity – which saves your show money too because then you're like, oh, the holodeck episodes are always one room. <laughs> um, and That's so an my episode, kind of program. Yeah, and so an episode like this – you, the cheapness, the cheapness feels part of the show because it's it's uh, it's a it's a saving saving energy <clears throat> decree as much as it's a saving money decree for the show. Um, but <laughs> All yeah, the other I, characters in the holodeck look like early nineteen nineties versions of video game characters. Yes, they're just like yeah. blocky faced. <laughs> they're, like, uh, they're all golden eye <laughs> characters. <laughs> It's karate chopping them in the face. It's it's a it's a live re- it's a live rendering scenario where anything just outside your your vision line is just all like pixelated and shit. It's like if you when turn, you go to see quick. a three D movie and you're too close and you can still see the the, the screen oh, the, outside yep. the parameters of your glasses and it's just all blurry. <clears throat> I think I think the bigger mistake in this setup is actually the energy rationing thing that they're trying to mm-hmm. sell to me. I don't really buy that. I would I would sure, buy it more sure. that, you know, this warp drive makes a ton of energy. We got a long trip home. People got to use the holodeck, you know? We got to sure, stay relaxed sure. out here. Yeah. This I I, I find or, that more believable than shut everything down. I I could buy the energy thing for a few episodes. Like mm-hmm. let them let them figure that out. Like let them have a small victory midway through the first season yeah. or something where they fix fix the energy problem or some shit, but then it's like, well, you know, you fix the energy problem, but you still gotta still gotta fly you put more gas yeah. in the car, but you still gotta drive to Tucson from from Georgia, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I was this was the um I know it's uh, just a, a downside of terminology and not really understanding things as you say them, but they're seventy thousand light years and uh this <laughs> for some reason I've only just started realizing that that means that, you know, it's incredibly obvious, but that means it takes light 70,000 years to get to how far they are. And I was like, wow, that's an mm-hmm. incredible distance away from home that they are right yes. now. So, yeah, it's, it's, it is, um, it's one of those things you don't really think about until you think about. Have you, have you heard the thing about um, the reason that intergalactic space travel is not actually physically possible, which I, I found to be very interesting, uh, which was that – the the distance between galaxies is so great that even at the speed of light, the universe is actually expanding 
too fast for you ever to close that gap. Right. Which is so why things are moving faster <laughs> away from you than the the speed of light is possible to get to or whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah, yeah, which is which is crazy. I mean, that's that's a level of like physics and travel science that is just you know really we're just ants. Yeah, we're just ants in our little our little hole here, just looking around at stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, it's um, you see all those YouTube videos of like the relative distance between things, and you're just like, well, it's an incredibly far, long distance away. From right, me. right. Not going to get there. Unfortunately, we'll get to Mars. We'll land on Mars. And I, we'll have holodecks on Mars. Anytime I got to drive like 15 minutes to the grocery store, I get annoyed. So, yeah, I won't, gonna, gonna, next, I won't be going to the next. I won't be going to Andromeda. That's I can tell you that much. <laughs> um, what the hell else happens in this one? Anything else? Uh, what do you think no. of his name? Do you like his name? <clears throat> no, it's it's just a joke, though, right? Mm. I don't. Not he doesn't, really. He, does he? He doesn't explain any backstory for it, right? It's just what he no. chooses. Yeah, just chooses was, it. Yeah. When the the moment when he <clears throat> reveals it had big Monty Python energy to me. I it, I reminded of I was reminded of there are some who call me Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. To yeah, someone I know. Would be like, yeah. choose your name. Choose your name. What are we going to call you? It's like, ooh. That's more pressure than what you name your kids. You know, it's like this is you know what thing. you do in this episode. You know what you do in this episode. <clears throat> you spend the whole episode with him hemming and hawing about the, the about choosing a name and what that means and, and the pressure that comes with that, right? And then through the course of this adventure, the adventure ends after he defeats Grendel and gets everybody back with the Vikings giving him a name, and so yeah. He's like Doctor Hrothgar or something. I don't know, but but you know what you know what I mean. Where it's like then it becomes part of the story when it's it's not just a throwaway thing. Yes. You can still joke about it. Where he's like, "What if you called me uh, Russell?" And it just doesn't like land right. And then right. eventually he you know earns the name that's given to him by the people that he saved. Even though even though it's a holographic program, it's still enough to uh, to touch to touch him um, by yeah. them giving, giving him a name personality. Until until he sees, until the end, when Harry's like, "No, they, t- they give everybody that name as soon as you finish the program. That's what you get." <laughs> I mean, with his Viking culture, it'd be like he who rapes and pillages the best. He's like, "Well, I can't go with that, unfortunately." <laughs> so it would be some. Just call me Tim. It would, you know, Harry what it would be? It would be something like uh, uh, it would be a like an Icelandic. Icelandic word for that represents the idea of doing no harm or something or doctor. Or, yeah. You know what I mean? Where it's like yep. he, yeah, yeah. Hippocrates, Hippocrates or something. That they're yeah. not going to go yeah. that obvious. I wonder how long they're going to drag this out. They they never name him. He never comes up with a name. So I don't know. Is this just going to be a, like a uh, a ghosting of a storyline where they're just not going to. Talk about it anymore, and mm-hmm. just drop it, and see see where it goes. That's the only I, place I can imagine. I, I, I don't know. Uh, if it was me, and I got to, if it was me, and I was writing the Doctor at a certain point, I would, I would just use it as an excuse to call out one of my um, movie and TV pet peeves, like writing pet peeves, which is that people in real life don't say names as often as they do in shows. And so, if I was if I was to write the Doctor, I would have him say something like, "Well, you know, honestly, I realized." I don't really call people by names very often, so there's no reason to call me by a name other than doctor. So, yeah, people call me Doc when they come. Yeah, in. say hey, what's up, Doc. That's, that's fine. Yeah, it's true. It's uh, it's unnecessary. I I I I guess the doctor's naming thing is funny to me because I I don't even really see that as his core. Th- Thing. I understand it. Right. Like they, he, they want people to respect him as a person. Therefore, he needs a name. But I feel like the name is just kind of a tangential, <laughs> not really relevant to the, the issue here. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it was much more interesting to me when he was dealing with crew members who clearly didn't think that he was a real person worthy of being like treated like a real person. Like they would ignore him yeah. or do whatever he wanted. I thought that was better. Th- this just... The name thing doesn't strike me as really the core of what the doctor's issues are as a, right. as a character. You know, so it's it's not that interesting to me. It's also something that I don't think realistically he would care about so early. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Because it's not like it's not like data where his entire thing is his quest to become more human, right? The doctor is there to do his job, and that's why yeah. he's there. As he's he left sees on more, superior to right. humans in some ways, like he's kind of snotty and snooty and stuff like that. As he spends more time among them, obviously his program starts to change and evolve, and he this stuff could become more important. So it feels like him wanting a name would be something you would do later down the line. Like I, I could, I could see Kess suggesting the name thing and then having him be like, no, that's ridiculous. Why waste time on that? Like in the first season. Right. And then like two or three seasons down the road, he's like, you know what? I think I want a name. I think I need, I'm at the point where I need to sign in to an email and I got to pick something to put in. <laughs> I need a credit score and I just yes. can't get one without a name. I'm try- <laughs> me and Freya are trying to buy a holographic house. <laughs> and they won't give me a holographic loan. <laughs> I've only been working on a Voyager for a year. I don't have two years of W twos. What am I supposed to do? This is impossible. And technically, Take- technically, I'm an independent contractor, so I don't even have a steady <laughs> paycheck. We don't even have paychecks in this future. How am I ever going to get a loan? <laughs> How sales crashing in twenty twenty three fifty one or whatever this year is? Just the the market completely upside down. Um. I guess that's kind of it for this one. I don't really have anything else. I mean, you My, you like Vikings. I do. I do. You like the Vikings. episode. <laughs> I did. Well, you know, one thing I will say that that Enterprise does have over this show is mm, this will uh, be interesting. Yeah, is action sequences. The fight scenes in this show so far have been terrible. The fight mm. scene in this one, they're all so stiff and feel like half speed and like very blocked. Um, What's the fight scene when he fights they, with the swords with the, the hothead? Yeah. When he fights with the hothead, it's just like very, it's not interestingly shot. Um, yeah. Th- there's, I feel like they, there was nothing written in the script in some places because he does that weird thing when he walks in and he grabs a torch and just walks up to the guy and then just kind of puts the torch down, but carrying the yeah. torch towards him, like freaks the guy out. <laughs> I don't know what that yeah. was about, but but yeah, the the here the fight scenes are not good. Um, the episode was it the last one with the the Kazon? Yeah, the last episode. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that that one action moment where Tuvok has to put put the guy up against the oh, wall with his bag. forearm yeah, is really right. weirdly yeah. blocked and doesn't really look good. I don't know what it is, but the the action that. Action combat type stuff has not been very good in the show. Mm, yeah, yeah, I would I would agree. I still I still like the fact that Voyager doesn't rely on it all the oh, time. Sure, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, it's definitely not. I, it's, I I mean I guess it's to this one's point, it's, it's charmingly it's supposed to be bad. I, I understand that it's it's filmed badly, and it could be filmed better in a way to show that the Doctor doesn't want to really want to fight this guy and stuff like that. But it's it, yeah. Also, I will say, not that I'm an expert on Vikings or anything, but if you lost a fight because you hit the ground too hard with your sword and it made your hands hurt, like if you hit a baseball <laughs> in the cold, I don't think you get to become king of anything and they would probably just give you a bloody eagle and sacrifice <laughs> you to their gods. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, I'm so – it's – it's April now as we're recording this, and the kids are starting to go to start playing baseball. But it's definitely hitting hitting baseballs in the the cold early spring and the late mm-hmm. the late autumn is not uh, not an enjoyable. No, hand experience. it's terrible. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's probably so painful. <laughs> what you can you can tell how much of a sheltered life I've lived, where that's like one of the key moments of trauma I remember from my childhood is playing baseball in the cold and and not hitting and a ball ringing. flush. Flush on the yep. barrel, and then you just like. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe I'm being too hard on the guy. I don't know. Being a good hitter is probably just getting beyond that fear of that hand yeah. sensation, and you just feel like I don't care about this. I'm going to crack this thing. I'm going to get hit the fat part of the it's bat. Too, I'm going to make some good contact. It's two levels of fear. One, the fear of your hands hurting after you swing, and the other one is the fear of someone throwing a ball at your face at 90 miles an hour or well, yep. 70 miles an hour or whatever. But. Yep, yep. Uh, 
I was just there's some Japanese pitcher who was in the news, but it's not it's not worth bringing up now at this point. I guess we're done with this one. Heroes and Demons. I uh, uh, did you have anything else you want to talk about, or do you want to go to final thoughts? Or no, I thoughts? was just going to say, following up on the on the on the baseball thing. My dad had a friend <clears throat> that he worked with years ago who used to play. Uh, he was he played minor league hockey, and. Um, he was at a training camp, like a scouting camp for the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, they were playing against the legit major league pro-level pro hockey players. <clears throat> he was a defenseman or something. And he said he was, he was skating. He was skating backwards. And one of, the, one of the big names on the Canadians, like, you know, Guy Lafleur or one of those guys, comes up, <laughs> comes up the boards, comes over the blue line. And he was like, I saw his stick go back, and I saw his stick go forward, but I didn't see the puck. I just felt it breeze by my face, and yeah. at that point, <laughs> I decided I was not made, built for this, and that was the last time I yep. played hockey. <laughs> <laughs> at least he knows he learns it early. Learn it early. Because there's all the baseball minor leaguers who play for years, and it's like – yeah. You know, you spend 10 years in the minors or whatever, and then you come out and you're 28 or something like that. And it's like you missed a big chunk and you didn't really get paid well. You, I was going to say, do you get like paid that. in the minors? You do, but not well. It's, it's like I, sub, sub what like a real job would be. Wow, really? Yeah, years ago, yeah. years ago, I had this uh, dream. Not a real dream, but it seemed like a good scam at the time. <clears throat> I wanted to become a single A knuckleball pitcher. Because I figured there are so few knuckleball pitchers that you only kind of have to know how to do it to get on a single A base minor league baseball team. So yep. I was like, if I could, if I could like slightly get the hang of this, I could probably get on a team uh, that that was not very good. And uh, unfortunately, I could never get the hang of it. So that's why I do podcasts now. <laughs> There's, a, there's something to be said about the level of desire there. It's like, I'll try to get into a field where not a lot of people do stuff, but I won't do it particularly well. No, you just <laughs> got to get in the door. You know, I'm not doing it to, I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it to say that I play right. professional baseball. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fine. I was, yeah. Like, when it, like my, my father's uh, British and he didn't grow up with baseball, but like, I think baseball might be his favorite sport like American sport. He's like very interested in it, but he's, he, I, in, a, in a very British way, I find that he was always very fascinated with the knuckleball and was constantly trying to throw a knuckleball just because he thought it was very clever, but it's um, hard. It is hard. Yeah. It's not yeah, natural. You, it doesn't feel right. No, no. Any, every, any time I've tried to do it or had somebody try to explain it to me, I do not understand the concept of it's like, you know, it, more of like a push. So like put your, put your fingers around. Yeah, just you, yeah, know, you got like to kind gotta, of bend this finger up into the ball and dig your yeah. fingers into it. It's like, what the hell? You got to get, your, finger, decides, who, get your fingernails in the there so you way. can throw it so it doesn't spin. It's very, very strange. There who was, invented there, that? I don't know. There was a summer, though, where I tried for over the summer to learn how to throw a knuckleball, and it did not happen. <laughs> 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 yep. I guess we're done with Heroes and Demons. There's no knuckleballs in this one to be said for anybody. So we'll go to thanking our patrons who support us on patreon.com slash the Penske file. Thanks very much, patrons. And if you want to support the show, people who are not patrons, you go to patreon.com slash the Penske file. Support us there. A couple dollars a month, you get extra podcasts. You vote on what we cover. You get all the Star Trek Picard and Strange New Worlds. You get Clay and Amanda talking about the second string of Stephen King. You get Batman-related content with Sean yelling about something. <laughs> you get a whole bunch of stuff. You want to hear him yell about stuff, Patreon's the place <laughs> yeah. to go. If you want to hear Sean get upset, go to Patreon. The episodes that go up before he can say, Clay, maybe cut that stuff out. The, the raw, unedited badass. Badass episodes, for people who don't know, are actually seven hours long each one, but they get yeah. edited down. Yeah. Yeah. So... Patreon is where you get all eight hours of badass. <laughs> we go we go name by name through the comic book industry each episode and just talk about how much we don't like everybody. So we cut all that yep. stuff out, though. So <laughs> <laughs> It's basically the comic book version of Hit 'Em Up from Tupac. It's just a lot. It's just really, it's like, that is vile that you would say that about a man's wife. Um, we're done. Thanks, patrons. Patreon.com slash Spencer And as always... We say thank you 
to our captain tier, who are the top tippity top tier. Special thanks here to Ben Douglas, Tark Latif, Andrew Turlock, Joint Mango, Christian Bouch, Cal Barrett, Mike Burnett, Matthew Ross, Michael Pond, Matt Cutler, Nick Sergey, Brandon Halsgrim, Sinto, Sean Bradley, Killens, Ball 13 Hero, Kevin Reyes, Jordan Cooper, Darth Moss, Russell O, Stephen Minton, HH28, Derek Zajac, Paul Roscoe, Jake 123, Patrick Seba, Dave Davies, Point Extra G, Barry Wallace, Jamie Crow, Captain Brazix, Eric Avila, Jakey's Gamer, Kevin Lowry, Nick the Rat, William Scheisler, Rahan Jaffer, Grapple John, Zorn, Zane Majors, Olivia Pardur, Tom Hickey, Jose Hunter, ZWNF Remixes, Captain Clunches, and James McLennan, Jonas, Tommy Tango, Dizbrada, Tuvix Most Die, Admiral Nakamura, Ed Mark Starr, <sighs> Chris McLaughlin, Royo, Jeremy Boot, <laughs> Jeremy Boudra, Rage Against the Machine, Rage right, for the Machine, nice. J-Man, The Undiscovered Mugato, Robbie Duffield, Will Clay, Atanga Udom, Artorius, and Zalen Maru. Thanks, everybody. For the record. For joining us. For the record. I will not. He won't. Will Clay or won't he? He has, he has an avatar of Joe Camel, though, <laughs> which is like real flashback to the oh, yeah. right there. Wow, yeah. Man, Camel. cigarette Don't, ads. Do Camel cigarettes still exist? <clears throat> Are Camels still a thing? Ooh, I don't think I've seen I anyone smoke a Camel. think so. That's a really good question, actually. I only see how Marlboro many cigarette Reds brands, at this point. Yeah, how many cigarette brands exist anymore? Just the big I only ones? see Marlboro Reds. I've never seen uh, from the people who smoke that I know, which is like a rapidly dwindling population. It's only Marlboros. Yeah, Virginia Slims probably still exist. Maybe I don't know. <clears throat> women don't really smoke that much, and the women who do smoke aren't smoking Virginia Slims anymore. You know. Mm. I'm seeing. Okay, according to the twenty, we're, this is how much we love this episode. Um, According to the 2020 st- Status to Survey, the list of the most appreciated brands in the USA are the following. Marlboro, Newport, Pall Mall, Camel is number four, so they still exist. Mm. American Spirit, Cool, Winston, Virginia Slims, Basic, and Salem. So they're all still around, I guess, yeah. just to varying degrees of of whatever. Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't, like, what does a pack of cigarettes cost at this day? Like 10 bucks, 12 bucks, oh, something like yeah, that, probably. with all taxes and stuff on it? Hmm, yeah. Interesting. Well, I hope Will Clay will let us know. He seems like a man who smokes camels and enjoys them. So hopefully we'll be able to figure it out. I hope he's got one of the coats. Like, remember, you can yeah. send in for like Marlboro the, the, bucks and stuff. <laughs> yeah, Marlboro. <laughs> I hope he's got a big windbreaker with Joe Camel on the back of it. Or a pool yeah. floor. Yeah, smoking really took a hit. I wonder why. Wonder wonder what happened to smoking. No, no <laughs> I wonder one knows. That went away. No, like we just growing up, you used to go to parent, kids um, whose parents smoked. You'd go in the house; they would smoke in the house and stuff. It just it mm-hmm. feels like out of a Mad Men episode at this point. It, if I went to someone's house and they lit a cigarette, I wouldn't be upset. But I'd be like, "Wow, this is." Yeah, I only any, have a couple of friends who smoke. Any time I walk by a laundromat, I get a flashback to my friend's house because his house always smelled like uh, vaguely of cigarettes and laundry detergent. Yep. Yep. No, they're on their way out. My no, my just, parents, uh, my parents never, my parents never smoked a cigarette ever. But they used to have ashtrays because they would have <laughs> friends over and their friends company. would smoke. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, they used to smoke in our house <laughs> when they would have yeah. yeah company yeah capital C company. Uh, but yeah, that's yeah, crazy. that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate um, accommodation right there. It's like yeah, mm-hmm. he's, he's smoking the house right now. Let's start smoking in the house again, guys. I know. There's Bring nothing, it back. There's nothing this. better. Nothing better than going well, on vacation. Just start smoking on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, why not? What the hell? Who's going to come after us? The FCC? It's, the it's ATF? Be like the, uh, we, I just have be like the libertarian um, open voting stuff when the libertarians have their silly ass little uh, party get together to decide who's going to run and lose on the libertarian mm-hmm. ticket. Yeah. They talk about like, what's next? You're going to need a license for your toaster and they're just smoking butts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody loves the way of bowling alleys smell or the way that like, yeah. remember, remember those great motel rooms you'd get on vacation where your, your dad forgets to ask for the no smoking room and you just walk in and it's just like stale <laughs> cigarettes and Clorox. <laughs> The yeah the the thing that um cigarettes under like cigarettes I think have been partially like I think that cell phones are probably an underappreciated killer of smoking 
to me. Interesting. Because what's, what cigarettes were, um, what I always enjoyed cigarettes for was that cigarettes are the perfect thing to kill five minutes while you're waiting sure. for something. Sure. And so you're like, ah, I got to boil for the water to boil for the spaghetti. It's like I'll smoke a butt and it'll be yeah. done when I come back. That's why That's but, why Dave started smoking when he was working at the bar up at Amherst. He would go yeah, and just, just have nothing to do. He'd go outside and have a cigarette. Nothing something. to do. Yeah. And, and, <clears throat> and I think that cell phones now fill that five-minute void of your life. You just waste your time yeah. playing Wordle or looking on Twitter or something like that. It's, it's maybe better for you, maybe not. Maybe it's better in some ways and worse in other ways. But it's probably an so underappreciated I guess- killer of smoking. What's what's better for society, going out and polluting the air with cigarette smoke or taking that five minutes to call someone you don't know the N-word on the internet? I don't know. That's, <laughs> and you can <clears throat> you can just vape and call people. That's true. Yeah. On the internet. Just just kill two birds with one Indoors. stone. Indoors. That's, that's <laughs> I know this, this is going completely off the rails at this point. My last thing is when um, – when vaping started, mm-hmm. and uh, one of my one of my friends who was smoking switched to vaping, and it was like the first time I'd seen an e-cigarette, an electronic cigarette. Mm-hmm. He brought it in, and we're like, "What the fuck? Like, what the hell is this thing?" Um, and he did it, and it, I just remember the comical amount of vapor that came out of his <laughs> track of the thing, and it was just like, "This is not going to last. This is just too absurd to have like basically a, a fog machine in your house while you're yeah. while you're smoking this thing." Yeah. Yep. It's like having one of those humi- humidifiers in your house where it just it's just a big cloud that just gets gets the table wet that the humidifier is yeah, on and doesn't <laughs> fix the house at all. If you're sleeping next to it, your bed gets wet and you just get yes. wet sheets yeah. all over yourself. Yes, it's yeah. not good. Don't need that. And now we find out that they explode. So what are you gonna do? You can't you just can't smoke. Thanks everybody. Supporting the show. Let's move to Patreon comments. How long have we been recording? It is time to move on. We'll be done in a few. If you support the show at the $5 and up level, you get to leave patron comments, and then we read them. I'm going to drag the window over here so I can see it. Norman Buckwald says, Heroes and Demons, the first Doctor-centric episode to have it mainly take place on the holodeck and how the Doctor is used is actually quite unique and intriguing. Still, the acting of the holodeck characters leaves a little to be desired, and Harry Kim hardly was in it, and it's his program, which is the way some of them talk uh, reminiscently of Barclay's Three Musketeers program. Still, the Doctor's journey is quite good, and it buoys what could have been a typical mediocre holodeck episode two above average. 3.5 swords out of five. Do you think... <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you think the doctor recognizes the fact that all he has to do to bring Freya back to life is restart the program? No. I don't know Doesn't why, that, though. I feel like that kind of is an example of what they leave on the table with this episode, right? Where it's like he right. has this moment where he recognizes the pain that he has suffered by watching this person he's grown to care about die. And then ultimately he's like, but what is life really if all I have to do is restart her program and she's back? Yeah. And interestingly, that's the opposite of his job, which you think would be right, right. for looking at what that means. Huh. Yeah. James McClendon says, I've always felt that enjoyment of a holodeck episode is proportionate to the enjoyment of the genre it's emulating. So when they render film noir and casino heists, I think they're great. But I have negative interest in Beowulf, so I find the premise to be a snooze. That being said, this is a vehicle for the Doctor, and it elevates it, be, uh, elevates it above mediocre, and you get some character development that he actually carries beyond this 45 minutes. Of course, they could have reworked the plot to occur in a 1960s Vegas lounge bar, and I would have been happier. Two out of five. Matt Ross says, in some ways, it's interesting that the Doctor is the only character that can deal with weirdness on the holodeck due to his glowing particles. Seeing the Doctor interact and be more of a person is fine. The rather abrupt ending of him tending to medical equipment at the end is an odd dead stop to the episode. Being stuck in Beowulf is different, but it overall felt a little bit flat. Three glowing globs out of five. Jonas, the best thing about this episode was anticipating the other Patreon comments about it. I don't even think I can rate it. If it hadn't starred Picardo, it might have been unwatchable. Question mark hmm. out of five. Wow. Latte Librarian says, is Voyager the first to use the term hollow novel? It does seem like a natural extension to differentiate from a hollow program that doesn't have a storyline. Why would all the other ho- What would all the other hollow genres be? Would there be a Sims or an Animal Crossing type hollow where people make other people and tend to gardens? Two Grendels out of five. I was going to make a, a, a joke and be like, well, you know, it's a real hollow novel. And then 
slight some novel, but I realize I'm not well read enough to actually do that and be accurate with my with my zinger. <clears throat> Tom Clancy wrote the best hollow novels. Yeah. You know, Jack. you know what's a real hollow novel? The Firm by John Grisham. <laughs> Great movie, though. <laughs> Would um. If there wasn't a hollow novel, which I cut, try to open the startup. So if you were just free to run a holodeck program, do you have anything that you'd be actually interested in? Like, it doesn't have to be tied to literature. It could just be any kind of game or anything like that. You know, I, I feel like I would probably end up doing something similar to what Paris does. Although, like, running a, a, a bar or something. Yeah, like, that'd be kind of fun. Having like a, a place to hang episode. out. Yeah. Yeah, like basically, yeah, I would be yeah. Sam in an episode of Cheers. I think is probably what I would do. You know, and have you could have a band come in and play and stuff, and just enjoy. It's all the all the fun of owning a bar and hanging out in a bar without actually having to worry about you know paying people and stuff and leases. Yeah, that's a good point. Alcohol licenses. Yeah, outside of his weird um, fetish for older women in that episode, like his his. Concept of having a club that he can hang out in is it's not not bad for a holodeck. I imagine that's what he'd actually be doing. <laughs> I'm sure it would it would be one of those things though where it would be like, so um this is a great bar. Uh did you program it to be across the street from that college, that all that girls college? It's like I hey guys. <laughs> it's just it's just how it came. It's Don't just, look at me. I didn't even notice that. Is that what's going on over there? That's terrific. Well, anyway, yeah. back, well, to this, back to these you know what? B- body shots. Education <laughs> is the is what I think is the most important thing. Yeah. I guess it just, it would just evolve into a strip club. You're just running a strip club. Mm-hmm. And you're like, this is what my holodeck program is. I'm, this is Honestly, wonderful. I'm sure I would probably have a program that was – I get to – it was like you get to be Jack Torrance at the Overlook Hotel. It's like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I get to hang out at the Overlook with some ghosts for a while, and that'd be fun. Yeah, I the the sitcom. I could actually insert myself into a sitcom episode. I'd like to be in like a Seinfeld episode. That'd be kind of fun. There's like yeah. novelty in that. I think that'd be that'd be interesting. Uh, thank you, Latte Librarian. She gave it a two Grendels out of five. That kid Ben says more like Beowulf. No, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I enjoyed the aesthetic, so three repeated scenes out of five. Three repeated scenes out of five. Three repeated scenes out of five. Aaron Million says, Ah, I got burned out on holodeck adve- episodes thanks to TNG with Barclay and then Jordy's creepy Leah Brahms one. At least Robert Picardo is good here, and it's nice to see him outside of sickbay. Two Schweitzers out of five. Zam Nuclear Vessel says, I like that to the Doctor, the holodeck characters are just as real as the crew, if not more so. The idea isn't fully developed here, but it's a step towards Voyager handling the sentience of computer characters better than any other shows. Three out of five. Cal Barrett says, I certainly didn't miss holodeck episodes during Enterprise. What's made the Doctor great so far is his relationship with humans, so for his first episode as a lead character, sticking him in the holodeck with a few fellow holograms for most of it, is a mistake. Unless he views holograms in a different way than most and is protective over his kin, but that's not explored at all. The idea of this being the Doctor's first away mission with Janeway now trusting him for such a task is a nice idea, but it feels more like an excuse to just revel in fake beards and general tomfoolery that the holodeck demands. I don't know what weird mix of deep-voiced Danish and English accents Freya was attempting, but she sounds exactly like Queen Amidala from The Phantom Menace. (laughs) Two seconds of the Doctor (laughs) touching Moss that almost makes the episode worth it out of five. All I can think of is this, uh, the guitar hero Freya, the sword is the Freya from the sword mm-hmm. is one of the songs in that one. Changeling, move over Atlas. Robert Picardo is carrying this entire episode on his shoulders. That's a timely reference because my five year old is obsessed with Atlas at this point. <laughs> your uh, five can hold up the world. Your five year old just read Atlas shrugged and he's obsessed with he's, it. <laughs> he's he's big into Ayn Rand. He he agrees that. Um, Charity is immoral. <laughs> Outside of the doctor scenes, there is no redeeming quality for this episode, and every time the plot rears its ugly head, my enjoyment falls into the pits of Niflheim, never to return. Also, I'm not a Star Trek expert, but I think they got the way the holodeck works wrong. It is just a combination of holograms and force fields, and not related to the replicators, so why do the aliens need the holodeck to capture people? One Norse battle babe <clears throat> out of five. It's not. When he says. It's not related to the transporter, but it just operates on similar technology, I think. That's what the what they're saying. Yeah, it's energy into matter. Same as yeah. the replicator. It's just you take energy yeah. and you turn it into matter. Um, but for some reason, 
the replicator can make it outside of a holodeck and you can eat it and it's just as good but the holodeck cannot do that for whatever reason that would be that would be a fun mix up if <clears throat> someone went to go use the holodeck and then they opened the holodeck door and just got hit with a wall a big flood of like tomato soup <laughs> Whereas in the, like, in, 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 the, the in the mess hall, disaster in Boston. Yeah, yes. <laughs> in the, the mess hall, someone <laughs> someone asks for a bowl of soup, and they end up getting like a, a Tommy gun. <laughs> for people who don't know, there's um there's some disaster in Boston where like a molasses yeah. factory exploded and it killed a bunch of people just because yeah. they got they got uh, drowned in molasses that was like running down the streets or something, but. Mm-hmm. It's, a, mm-hmm. it's a strange, a strange, horrific uh, death sequence. Point Extra G says, Heroes and Demons, Voyagers first. The holodeck is broken. It's not working episode. We'll have to keep a tally of these. In the background, they've been building up for something to happen with the Doctor, and that arc culminates here. He's really the breakout character of the show to this point. This is one of the more clever uses of the holodeck malfunction. It gives the Doctor a chance to leave sickbay and tells a solid sci-fi story while they do it. Rayo says, it's another one of those frustratingly mediocre Voyager episodes that are a slog to get through while not being overtly bad. The cliche holodeck malfunction story, but this time with a cast of smooth-headed Enterprise Klingon shouting yet more cliches. But at the very least, the twist of letting this be the Doctor's first away mission stops it from being trash. Robert Picardo is a good actor, but unfortunately he's acting against cliche Klingons and it feels very rote. Recycling the it's a life form concept from the cloud just adds to the sense of, I think it means repetitiveness. Two out of five. Undiscovered Mugato says, 10 minutes in and I was daydreaming about Angelina Jolie and heels and spiked tails, Grendel's mother and the Zemeckis CGI ah. masterpiece Beowulf. 30 minutes in, I was daydreaming about Angelina Jolie and heels and spiked tail in that Disney joint Maleficent. <laughs> By the time the credits rolled, I was daydreaming about Angelina Jolie and heels and a spiked tail in that Nick Cage jam gone in 60 seconds. Anyway, sure. it was tedious and I had trouble focusing. One little Schweitzer out of five. Applicable to Very many good. situations. Very good. Brent Mays says, I love Heroes and Demons. Lord Schweitzer saves the day. Suspend your disbelief and you'll love it too. Four out of five phrase. Christian Pouch says, there's a lot of silly in this episode, but none of it matters because of Picard's outstanding performance as the Doctor. I felt more for Freya than I did for anything in Enterprise. I loved it. Five out of five. Wow. Dear God. When did he All comment right. this? At like 2 a.m. on a Saturday? All right. There you go. Five out of five. Christian's been hot on all the Voyager so far. He gave another one a five, too. So clearly the greatest episode or season of Star Trek for him. Brandon Howell's final comment. A guilty pleasure for me as I've loved the Beowulf story since I was about 10. Hrothgar has no daughter named Freya that I'm aware of. And I'm sorry we never get to see Harry as Beowulf, which suits him much better than future holodeck appearances. Hail Lord Schweitzer. I'd much rather listen to the Beach Boys heroes and villains than watch... Voyagers, heroes, and demons. Two I, Amuta plants out of five. I do believe, yeah. I think that is a big change. I, I, it's been a, forever since I've read Beowulf, but I do not think there are any women in that story. Yeah. Makes sense. Frey is just a Norse god or something, mm-hmm. right? So, yep. Yeah, I think so. So I always yeah, get it is what it is. I get Freya and Frigga mixed up. They might be the same. I'm not totally mm-hmm. sure, but I can't remember. Is that like a, uh, a Greek and Roman renaming the same gods type situation, I honestly, potentially? I, I don't remember. One of them is uh, Odin's wife. I can't remember which one. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Thanks, patrons. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. And most of all, thank you for commenting with your thoughts about Heroes and Demons, whatever this one is called. Fairly negative from the patrons there, Clay. I would... I would Say that that's the lowest average we've seen. A lot of twos and a couple yeah, ones probably. and a, a five for whatever that's worth. But what are you going to give it on a scale of one to five? Um, first of all, <clears throat> according to the very quick Googling that I did, uh, Freya taught Odin much of what he knew when it came to magic. Frigg was Odin's official wife, but it has been determined that she is an exact duplicate of Freya, making them one and the same. So... Pick your poison with that one, I guess. Mm. Um, I would give. I'm going to give this one a three because I, I, again, I, I tend to give high marks for interesting concepts, and even though they don't do anything with it, um, it the 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 pro, the potential of the the, of the concept g- got me through it and made it interesting enough for me. But if that hadn't been there, this easily would have been a two. 
but I'll, I'll give it a three. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I'll give it a two. I've been I've been trying to think about how I define a two because I think my four is very clear to me, which is a four mm-hmm. is I defined it as I would show this to someone and say, you should watch this episode. This one's pretty good. And that's how I can easily determine if something's a four. A two is a little tougher because it's more like I always defined it as like it's an okay episode with some problems to it. I, I think what really defines a two for me is that I don't feel the like – it's not the need to watch it, but it's. I think it's like when they when an episode becomes skippable or like there's no real reason sure. why you should watch this one. And sure. I, I think that this is that. This is the first one of this Voyager season where I felt like all the previous episodes were either three or higher just because it's like, oh, this one's adding a little bit of something to it. Like I, I kind of think that this is worth watching. But mm-hmm, this, if mm-hmm. I were to go through and someone were to make me watch Voyager again, this would be the first one that I would skip. Probably. I don't I don't think I got enough out of it. I don't think that even with an interesting concept, the concept is so badly executed, I think that it's not worth going back to at that yeah, point. That's fair. Yeah. I'll give it a two. It's fine. It it wasn't a terrible episode, but I wasn't crazy about it. Sure. And as um as one of the patrons said, a lot of the holodeck I would agree that a lot of the holodeck depends on how much you like the source material that mm. they're referencing. Yeah. And this one doesn't do anything for me. That's it. Thanks, patrons. Thanks, everybody, you know, for listening. You know supporting. they discovered America, Wes, before anybody I else know. did, the Vikings. Did and they make they it left. to America proper, or were they just up in Canada? <clears throat> in Nova yeah, I think, it was like, We've had I think it was Nova Scotia. Yeah, Nova Scotia. They never made it far enough. Would Neither have been did Columbus. Well, he discovered at least, like, resort areas. You know, yeah. He probably stayed at Atlantis <laughs> and stuff like that when he got over there. And it's wonderful. <laughs> was was As was some, was Columbus the first shitty tourist to the Caribbean? You yeah, know well, what? Columbus was probably. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what Columbus would do. <laughs> he would order some fish and then not eat it if they didn't have tartar sauce. That's what he would do. <laughs> he was going to find a way to get tartar sauce. It was the spice trade. <laughs> yes, they just don't yes, talk specifically exactly. about what so- what spice he was looking for. He's looking yep. for tartar. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. All that dry – Europeans just eating dry fried fish. They're just going, what the hell is this? This is no good. We need a better way to fix this. Yeah, Columbus was the first um, first person to tell you call himself a traveler when all he does is goes to third world countries and stays in plantation states that are like yes. armed by armed guards and yes. he considers that he's traveled the globe or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's Columbus, I think. We're, we're, we're showing our ignorance of history, I suppose. That's it. We're done. Thank you, patrons. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you for letting us know what you thought about whatever the hell this one's called, Heroes and Demons. I give it a two. Clay gives it a three. We're almost done with Voyager's first season, Clay. But wow. I guess uh, we're done with this episode. So support the show at Patreon if you guys are so interested. And we do all the Star Trek coverage. We have all the other stuff that I talked about there. We've got Strange New Worlds. We've got the Stephen King second string. Clay, do you have anything you want to add before we head out of here? Uh, yeah. I've got a, a new comic book on the shelves. It's called Poser. It's a punk rock slasher horror story. It takes place in the California punk scene. So if you like horror and music and the col- collision of the two, you'll like Poser. Obviously, Bloody Hell's still out there. And uh, it was just announced that in July... I will be uh, DC Comics will be releasing a Red Hood comic, two issues that Sean Murphy and I wrote that take place inside his uh, Batman White Knight universe. So be sure to check that out. I'd be much obliged. Can people pre-order that at this point? I think so. Um, do you have to go to a I'd, store to do that? Uh, you can. You can do it through. A comic book store. You'd, I think you'd have to do it through a comic book store, or you can get it on Comixology and stuff like that once it comes out. But yeah, the, the tough thing with like floppy comics is you can't like you can't just buy floppies on Amazon. So you kind of have to go to the store to, to yeah. do it. Um, <clears throat> yes, but yeah, so it, it's out there. So you know, it will be out there. I was listening to um, uh, you and Sean talk on. Whatever episode it was where he was talking about, uh, uh, sort of discussing the, the marketing that goes into these things oh, sure. or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a I had a perspective that I wonder how common it is because because I don't follow comics particularly well. Mm-hmm. I went and I tried 
and he and he and he was talking about the lack of marketing and stuff like that. I went and I tried to buy it, and I had a harder time than I expected finding the one that he was talking about. Do you know what sure. I mean? So yeah. I, like, mm-hmm. I, I was flooded with stuff that was like, I don't know which one I'm supposed to buy. Which one is the one that I the one that I want to get? And I suppose that if you know what you're talking about, and you know comics, maybe that's a little bit different. But I was mm-hmm. surprised by going through Amazon how hard it was for me to figure out what I was looking at, sort of. If that makes oh, any sense. Oh, interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. Was did you because he did had, you manage to find it on Amazon? The the single, I found it on Amazon. The single issue. Oh, you did. Okay. Well, I, I think it might just be because now Comixology is integrated with oh, Amazon. Sure, sure. It might have just sold me the digital version if I bought it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I have the digital, but I, I saw it on Amazon as a listing type thing. So, right, right, right. Uh, but it shows up in my Comixology <laughs> app that way. But <clears throat> yeah. I was just, that was just one. And it just got me get – because there's so many comics, the churn is large in comics. So it's like – I was just wondering, is it a marketing thing or is it like it's, you're really struggling to just – almost find stuff. Even if you know what you're looking for, it can be sometimes difficult to track down what you're trying to do. I don't know what yeah. an analogy for it would be. I, I think it's, I think it'd be, it could be a little of both. Um, <clears throat> Cause the, the other thing that was tough too is that I know is DC had another Batman beyond book coming out like right around the same time. So that made it even more difficult to figure out like, all right, well, which one am I supposed to be looking for here? Right, which one is which? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so that makes things difficult. And yeah, I mean the, the never ending struggle for comic books is getting them in front of people easily. And Mm -hmm. since the, everything moved to the direct market where it's mostly through dedicated comic stores, it's harder to get single issues in a way that is not confusing. Um, it's the newsstands don't really exist anymore the way that they used to for comics and, and Amazon has like never really been a good place to do that. I think because you know, you're going through second or like third hand distributors to get these single books that they're shit, you know? So it just yes. gets the, it's, it's hard enough to buy like a DVD and know what version you're getting. Uh, I'm sure it's twice as hard on Amazon to to try and buy like a single comic or something like that. You probably have better luck on eBay, frankly. Yeah, you'd at least see a picture like of it existing on someone's table or something. Yeah. As they they take a picture. Yeah, they Amazon is weird for it. I never feel like I I'm going to get the thing because a lot of them mm-hmm. have no reviews, which it makes it seem like it's like is this the real product? Like why is right. it, why is there not right. a single review on this thing? Yeah. Uh, that's it. We're done. Patreon. You find all that stuff. All right. Uh, the next episode is where the hell did my little guy go? There he is. Not the first time here. Cathexis, I think. I think is how you pronounce it. Cathexis. Cthulhu's so, brother. Cathexis is his uh, tax account, uh, attorney, I believe. So <laughs> we have a lot of number crunching to look forward to. Getting your taxable gross mm-hmm. income all the way down to whatever you can be. And then, you know. Making six digits, six figures, six digits, six figures, and still having a hard time buying a house. That's it. We'll talk about all that next week and more. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We will see you later.